We've been working our way through the book of Colossians, and uh, in the last section of Colossians that we studied, Paul showed us clearly how high the cost of our reconciliation to God really was. That opportunity, right, that way that is made for us to have peace with God, for us to have a right relationship with him. It came at a high cost, right? He said in, in verse 22 of chapter one that we were reconciled in the body of his flesh, his flesh being Jesus, through death. And so we need to understand it wasn't just simply a, a cut that Jesus got and he bled from, and then that was sufficient to save us. We need to remember he was beaten, he was bruised, he was scourged, he was nailed to the cross, he had a crown of thorns pressed into his head, he bled and he died. He said also in that section that it was through the blood of the cross. And we can imagine, right? We can imagine what that cross looked like that Christ hung upon, covered in his blood. It was poured out. When we sit, when we ponder the wonder of our reconciliation, and it's a wonder. Your reconciliation is a wonder. Take time and think about it. Later this afternoon, this week, all year, it'll still leave you in awe and it should bring you to a place of worship. That's a proper response to understanding what God has done, right? Because God is the one who did all the work to reconcile us. We committed the infraction, not him. And yet he provided the way to reconcile us. The way is there. Every obstacle has been removed. We simply need to accept that which Christ has provided. We place our faith and trust in him and by his grace, by his amazing grace alone, we are saved. We're saved. How wonderful. Isn't it wonderful? Well, in verses 24 through 29 this morning, Paul rejoices in his sufferings for Christ and his sufferings for the body, that being the church. And then he goes on to share what a privilege it is for him to labor exhaustively, as it should be for every single one of us as believers, in sharing the good news of the gospel, which he also reminds us once again, and it's a good reminder, that it's for every man. The message isn't for exclusive people. You ever get that before? Like, this message is for so-and-so. Or this message is only for the ladies. This message is only for the men. The gospel's for everybody. Amen. It's for everyone. So let's go ahead and read our, our verses this morning, picking up in verse 24. He says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory, of the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And to this end, I also labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Amen? Amen? So Paul starts out here at verse 24, and he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. I don't know about you. I read it, and I'm like, man, Paul, why you got to say that? 
Why do you got to start out going, I rejoice in my sufferings? Why can't you say, I'm frustrated in my sufferings? Don't you want to, I want to read, I'd be like, amen. <laughs> I'm frustrated in my sufferings. I just want to take a little time to complain in my sufferings. I just want everybody to know I'm fed up with them. I don't get to read that. Paul starts here and he says, I rejoice my sufferings for you. And it's not only that, it's the fact that we realize Paul's writing this letter to them from prison. Prison. I was in the jail ministry before. One thing I can tell you I didn't see a lot of in the jail ministry. You want to know what it is? Rejoicing. It's not a lot of rejoicing. And Paul's there. And I think about it, I'm like, man, there's a lot of things Paul could be ju- doing to occupy his time while he's in prison. But what we actually find out while he's there in Rome, he's in the Roman prison, what we find out is he's busy. He's busy doing what? He's writing this letter. He's writing the letter to the Philippians. He's writing the letter to the Ephesians, and he's even writing a more personal letter to the letter of Philemon. So Paul's doing. He's encouraging. He's exhorting. He's teaching through the letters. And if you read Philippians, right, which the theme of Philippians is what? Joy. Thanks, Paul, again. Joy and rejoicing. It's a repeated theme all through Philippians. And then we read, right, as you get there in that first chapter, he's talking about, he's like, man, all these things that people meant for, for my, you know, undoing for bad, the Lord's using it for good. Caesar's households come into the Lord. They're actually going to greet you at the end of this letter. They're super happy. We're all connected. People are coming to the Lord. Paul's ministering there to the guards. He's sharing the gospel with whoever's willing to listen. And even if they weren't, I imagine... Right? The guards got a little tired of it. And I go, oh my gosh, I'm on Paul duty today. And I have to listen again and again. Why? Because it's his passion. It's his heart. Is that they would have the opportunity to know. And this is what Paul's doing. And what we see in the life of Paul is what? His life is focused on the Lord. His life is focused on the message of the Lord. And his life is focused on and the people of the Lord, and bringing people to the Lord. And this is where I think we get a window into Paul's heart and his mindset, is Romans 8, 18. Because it's here he says that he does not consider the sufferings, right? He's back at it. Of this present time worthy to be compared to the glory that is yet to come. It doesn't matter what I go through because heaven awaits. It's his mindset. It's simple. No matter what I may face, no matter what affliction or hardship that comes in, when I put it in the scale and I put Jesus in heaven that awaits on the other side, it's so much heavier. It's so worthwhile. And so he says here, he rejoices in his suffering for others. And really what he's saying is that he could see that his sufferings were actually working something good for others And that was a reason for rejoicing. It's working something good in them. (laughs) Suffering when it comes into our lives is not pleasant. Amen? You didn't say amen. Suffering's pleasant? Listen, I don't know anyone, anyone, praying for suffering to come into their lives. No one. I have never had anybody go, Jamie, could you pray for me? Of course I could pray for you. Would you pray that there would be an abundance of suffering in my life? I'm not sure I want to pray that one for you. Now, if there's a sense of responsibility in that moment. Nobody's praying for it. We're pl- praying for the suffering to, to go. That's what we do. But when you get to see the fruit of your suffering that should always bring you to a place of rejoicing. That there's fruit on the other side of it. How many of you here have ever gone through something really, really difficult? 
You get all your hands up. In church, you have to be honest. We've all experienced suffering. In the midst of that suffering, do you ever wonder why? And that cross your mind there, you're just like, why am I going through this suffering? There's a why. Did you keep telling yourself Romans 8, 28, right? You know that all things work together for good for those who love God. It's working together to do something good. I'm just trying to keep my mind wrapped around that. I don't really understand all that's going on. I don't have to understand everything that's going on, but there's something good. And then you make it all to the other side. And you're so thankful, Lord, thank you. I can see the other side. And then you're talking to somebody and they're sharing about the trial that they're going through. And then what happens? And wouldn't you believe it? It's the trial you just went through. And now the Lord is using you, the Lord is using your suffering to the blessing and encouragement of your brothers and sisters. There's fruit on the other side of the suffering that you get to bless and encourage the family. And here's the thing, the Lord gets the glory. It's nothing that you did. It's what the Lord did. And then we can rejoice in how the Lord used our suffering to bless others and to give them hope that the Lord will see them through too. That's the wonder of it. We suffer, it blesses others, and they have hope. And we've been on the other side too, where we've gone through it, and then we get to talk to somebody, and they've walked through it with the Lord, and it gives us hope. That the Lord's with us. He's going to see it through to the end. Guess what the Lord does? And I just want to encourage you to be sure that you're letting the Lord use your sufferings to the blessing and benefit of the body. It's a blessing. And this thing, you'll find yourself over time, you'll begin to thank the Lord for allowing us to go through things just so we can be an encouragement to other people. You may suffer. And you may suffer when you you step out to serve. You may be called at some point in time in your life to leave certain conveniences. I can tell you, because I've served overseas, there's a lot of conveniences to America that you Take for granted every day. You may be called to let go of conveniences, comforts in life. You may have to say goodbye to family, to friends. You may have to change and transcend cultures, which is wild. And you do this all in your sacrifice and service to the Lord. And I'll tell you, it'll be hard, not impossible. It's going to be hard But it will never be impossible. But remember who it's for. It's for your Lord and Savior. And he's worthy of that. He's always worthy. And if he asks you to let go of certain things, he's going to replace it with other things. And it's always going to be sufficient and it's always going to be what you need and it's going to be when you need it. He's that kind. He's that good. Remember your Lord and what he's given up for you. He left his throne in heaven to come to earth. You think of all the things that maybe you could leave in life or have to let go of. You're never doing that. He left perfection. He left that throne to come here. And when he came, he knew all the sorrow and the suffering associated with the cross. He didn't arrive and they go, wait, what exactly is going to happen now that I'm here? He knew it. He knew what was coming. He knew everything that would be required of him to save his people. And here's the thing. He never shrank back from doing it, did he? He didn't. He did it to completion. 
And actually, in Hebrews 12, 2, what do we read? We read that Jesus, who for the what? Joy that was set before him, endured the cross and despised the shame. There was a joy in it. He knew what the fruit of the cross would produce. He knew what that suffering from the cross would produce. It was a reason for him to rejoice. Why? Because it would be salvation for all who believe. He knew one day you and I would be rescued and redeemed. And that brought joy to his heart. And he said, I'm willing to endure all of that for you, for me. That's his love. And so may we look to our sufferings, not as a difficulty, but a reason for rejoicing. That it's a reason to rejoice and that it's something that can be used for his kingdom and his glory. Well, let's keep going. Verse 24 continues and says, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Listen, when you read this verse, and it seems a little hard to understand what exactly is Paul saying. But one thing we know for sure is that Paul does not mean that there is something lacking, that there is something deficient in the atoning work of the Lord on the cross. It does not say that at all. That was complete. That was finished. How do we know it was finished? Jesus said it himself, didn't he? He said on the cross, what? It's finished. It's done. It's all taken care of. There's absolutely nothing to be added to what's been done. The atoning work is finished. And so what really seems to be what Paul is saying here is that Christ is so intimately connected to his body, that being the church, that when they suffer, he still today suffers with them. Have you ever watched somebody you love dearly go through something difficult and you're completely at a loss and broken for them? You're not even going through it, but you just, you can see it. And it breaks your heart. You can feel all their hurt. You can feel their pain because your life is so intertwined with their life. It's not something foreign or hard to see. You love them. That's our Lord. That's our Lord and that's his relationship with the church. You need to understand, he is never, ever Distant. He's never out of touch with us in all that is going on in our lives. He is intimately involved with each and every one of us. That's how much he loves you. You know, we get a glimpse of this in John with Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus died. Jesus is a little longer. According to Mary and Martha, he took a little too long getting there. But Jesus knew what he was doing. And they wanted him to be there because their brother died. And then we get the smallest little verse in the Bible that says that Jesus did what? Jesus wept. Jesus didn't weep for Lazarus. He knows he's resurrecting him in just a minute. It's moments away. He's weeping for them. He sees the pain and the hurt and the anguish of the loss. They lost their brother whom they love dearly. He can see everything that they're going through. He feels that pain and it breaks Jesus' heart. He weeps for them. And so it's no different for us, brothers and sisters. It's exactly the same. When you suffer, when you go through those things, he weeps with you. We know that he's intimately involved with his church. Why? We can see this just at Paul's conversion, Acts chapter 9, right? On the road to Damascus, 
Sees the bright light. He's on the ground. Can't see anything going on. He's having a conversation with the Lord. And the Lord says something to him. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, I haven't done anything to you. But you did because you've done it to my church, my people, my children, and I love them. And every attack you've made on them, you've made on me, and I have felt it. And that has not changed. 2,000 years later, he feels your hurt and your suffering. And that should comfort you. That should be such an encouragement and a comfort to you that he loves you that dearly. You know, and I just was like, man, maybe, maybe somebody here just needed that reminder. Right? Been going through a very difficult time, and I felt alone, and I've wondered where the Lord is. He's right there, and he's weeping with you. Be comforted with the comfort which he only knows to comfort you with. Let him comfort your heart. He wants to, and he loves to do it. Well, verse 25 said, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And so here in 25 and really to the end of the chapter to verse 29, what we're really going to see is Paul's fierce determination to share the gospel message with anyone. That's his heart. I'm looking for a pulse. If you got a pulse, I got a message. That's Paul's heart. And Paul says, it says here that Paul is a minister of the gospel. Don't get hung up on the word minister. Right? We can look and be like, sweet, that verse is for Jamie. And other people that are ministering. Well, until we translate it. Minister is the word servant. Welcome to the club. If you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you're a servant of the Lord, which means the message of the gospel is just as much yours as it was for Paul. It's our message. It's our good news to be able to share with others. And I love that he says it. Paul was called to be a minister. You were called to be a minister. I'm called to be a minister. And Paul goes, I know as a servant of the Lord, he's called me to minister to the Gentiles, and I'm going to steward that as long as I'm breathing. I'm going to keep sharing the message. And understand Paul's heart. He wants to carry out this commission, the idea of kind of stewarding, this commission of sharing the gospel in a way that it truly begins to take root in the life of a believer. It's not just like a quick flash in the pan, but he really wants them to know what it is to walk with the Lord and that their lives would begin to produce fruit. That's what we should be doing. We pour into one another. When we hear that somebody's given their life to the Lord, we don't just leave it at that. We actually want to take the time to disciple them, right? This is why the Great Commission is what? Go and not make converts, but make disciples. It's going to require your time. So make disciples. We know that this is Paul's heart. In Ephesians 3.8, he says, To me this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles, what? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, if we're going to take the time to look at the unsearchable riches of Christ, we're going to be doing it for a while. There's a lot there. And we all can do it. And Paul says, I want you guys to know Christ and know him deeply. Is that your heart? First for your own life. Man, that I know Christ and that I know him deeply. And as I know him deeply and I realize the wonder of what I have in him and this salvation that he's given to me, is that my heart for other people that they too would know him deeply? And really what it boils down, is Christ your passion? Do we have an intense determination to share the gospel with others? We have to be determined. This world wants to eat our time with senseless things. If I go like this and do this motion, anybody know what I'm doing? <laughs> you know what I'm doing. It's senseless. 
People are dying separated from the creator of the universe for eternity. Not a moment, not a year, not a decade, not a generation, forever. And he's called us to be those servants, to share. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There is no other way. There is no plan B if plan A doesn't work. There's only plan A. It's the gospel. It's all we have. Give people the gospel. Give people Jesus. We're all ministers of the gospel. The question is, are we stewarding the message well? Are you stewarding the message well? It's not just for you, it's for me. Jamie, are you stewarding the message well? And listen, this certainly isn't for a lack of people who need it. Walk around. You'll see really quick a bunch of people who need the transforming work of the gospel in their life. What we need more of is willing people to let them know there's a transforming work of the gospel for their lives. That's what we need to do. You know, I was challenged recently to ask the Lord to give me one person this year to lead to the Lord, to pray for that. That that's what we're doing. We're actually praying. And I look at the first service. I see you guys here. I know there's a lot of people away and then there'll be third service. Imagine if each one of us, that was our prayer. Lord, bring me one person that I can lead to the Lord. If we all do that, one, then times five, then times 10, is that gonna transform where we live? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And as I've been challenged, I challenge you, pray and ask the Lord to give you one person. Lord, bring me one person that I can share the sweet message of the gospel with. You know, maybe the first prayer we have to do before we get going is, Lord, give me a passion to share the gospel with others. Light that fire in my heart, Lord. Because the thing is, guys, when we're passionate about things, you know and I know we want people to know. You ever been with a group of people and you're just trying to find your in to be able to share what you're passionate about. And you're like, I need to weave this and I want people to know what I like. And you're just like looking for any opportunity just so you can let that get in there. And people are like, oh. And then you can talk about it for how long? Forever. So you love it. Make Jesus that thing. That you're looking for. Oh, where can I weave it out? There it is. There's my launch and end point. And now I'm going to give you Jesus because I'm passionate about him. You share the gospel and our precious Lord is your master passion. Amen. Don't let it compete. Give him the throne of your heart. He's do it. That he has your heart and your whole heart. Let's keep going. Verses 26 and 27. It goes on, he says, in the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It says there's been a mystery, it's been hidden for generations, but it's now revealed in believers. Now listen, if you read the Old Testament, you can see that there's aspects of God's plan that weren't clearly revealed because it required Christ for that revelation to come clear, right? And the biggest mystery revealed, and this is really what Paul's hitting on here, is that God's redemptive plan through Christ was not just for the Jews, which would have been Paul's mindset at first. They were waiting for the Messiah. But when he realizes, it's for everybody. Can you imagine that moment? He goes, whoa, because I thought just a second ago, all I had to do was evangelize my people. Now I realize I have the entire globe. He realizes it's for all men, that in Christ, he was going to make a new man, right? That's Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians two, 
starting in verse 12. And he is speaking to them, the Gentiles. He says, And you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Can you imagine if that was the only verse? You'd be like, There's nothing. You're without hope. You're alienated. Nothing. But now in Christ Jesus. Whew. So thankful for verse 13. You who once were afar off have been brought near by what? Because it's the only thing necessary, the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of his commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself what? One new man from the two thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the en enmity. Paul's like, it's for everyone. He realized God's plan was so much grander and more wonderful than anyone could ever imagine. He's like, hey, listen, if we could just rescue all my brothers, all, all the Jewish people, that would be amazing. But now he's like, can you imagine we can rescue the world to the Lord? And he was not just willing to rescue just the Jews. That's what he realizes. In verse 27, he says, what the riches of the glory of this mystery is, he says it is what? It is Christ in you. You're rich. You're rich. You have Christ in in you, Christ is indwelling and abiding in you and I. Think on that. He abides in you. And because he abides in us, it says what? That we have the hope of glory. It's all him. You and I, we've done nothing. We deserve nothing. And it's not because I am so highly and greatly devoted. It's none of that. It's simply because of his great grace and his kindness towards us. We have hope. First Peter 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to what? A living hope. It's alive because Christ is alive. And he's seated next to the Father right now. It's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. That's why no one can touch my inheritance. It's in heaven. It's been reserved for me. Earthly inheritances, we can go like that. Don't set your hope and plans on those things. They're not guaranteed. Your inheritance in heaven, that treasure that awaits your Lord, it's there waiting. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this you greatly, look at Peter carrying the same thing, rejoice. Though now for a little while, if needs be, you have been grieved by various trials. It's just going to happen that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you, what? You love him. Do you love him? It's worthy of your love. And though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible. Is that you? Just I am walking around every day with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Christ in us is the hope of glory. It's the hope of glory. Yes. Well, let's bring this to a close. In him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. I like it. Paul says what? Right there in the verse? He says, in him we preach. He's like, that's all I got for you. If you're looking for something more, I don't have it. 
All I have for you is Jesus. And he says every man three times in that verse. Why? It's to drive home a point. And that point is what? That Jesus is for who? Every man. Every man. There it is. So if you're ever confused and you wonder, is, I might need to, I should probably share the gospel with that person, but is it for him? Now you know. Jesus is for every man. And he says first, to warn every man. Warn would better be translated to exhort and admonish. Because what Paul is saying is he wanted to give every person the opportunity to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, to admonish them to do so, that the opportunity was there, that salvation was available. And he doesn't go on, he goes on to say that we would be teaching every man, right? And that's Paul's heart, that they would grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord, that they would be growing in the likeness of Jesus. That's our sanctification, that we grow and look more and more like him each and every passing day. And the goal for Paul was that this would produce spiritually mature believers. And he wanted to walk them through the different stages of their faith from their justification and walking it out in their sanctification and maturing in their faith in the Lord and that one day he himself would stand with them when they're glorified, when they're perfected. And that's what awaits each and every one of us. And in 29 he says to this end, that being the preaching of the gospel I labor exhaustively in the strength of the Lord. And what we need to remember is Paul at one time was what? He was an enemy of the church, wasn't he? Man, he stood against it. He was an enemy of the gospel. No, it was not his thing. The law was, the gospel was not. And then Jesus met him, came to him. That's, Jesus went to him and he saved him. And there on the road to Damascus, Paul had the opportunity to know the sweetness of his Savior. And then he began to learn that this message, this salvation, was for every man. That the most wonderful message known to all mankind is for all mankind. And he knew he was compelled he had to share it. That should be our heart. Like, we know what the gospel is. We know what its power is. We should be compelled to share it. And this was a message he was willing to give his life for. Why is the gospel so sweet? If you're a child of God, look at your own life. How sweet is it? What was your life before? And we all have this But then God intervened. And what does it look like now? It's because the gospel is sweet. Because Jesus is sweet. And I love the gospel because it can can rescue anyone at any time. There's no time constraint to it. No one's out of reach of the Lord. It can rescue a a young child, right? You watch a little kid give his life to the Lord, and then he has the rest of his life to surrender to the Lord and what he wants to do with it. But then we have the example also, right? There at the end of Christ on the cross, the thief on the cross, that it's so tender and it's so sweet that it will reach that person, that dying person at the end of his life, that dying sinner can know that there is a Savior who loves him, that has died for him. And if he'll just simply place his faith and trust in him, heaven awaits. That's the sweetness of the gospel. It's a privilege It's an honor to share the gospel. Paul knew this. We have to know this. It's the power of God unto salvation. It's a privilege to share. You know, best man, best uh, maid of honor in a wedding, what's their one requirement to do? They got to share a speech, right? And talk about that best friend that they've grown up with forever. And as they give them away, in a sense, to the other one. We have the gospel. 
Our speech is Jesus. We need to give them away to anyone. Because how much more is our message better? Because our message can save. And mind you, when somebody places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, all heaven erupts. If that moment of salvation whips heaven into a frenzy of rejoicing, it should do the same for us. So as we close, I just want to reflect and if the worship team could come. I just want to ask you, are you just, are you rejoicing when you suffer? Are you letting the Lord use your sufferings to the blessing and benefit of the body? To be an encouragement, to give hope. Use it. Because he's going to use your suffering to produce fruit for his kingdom. And do we have a fervent desire to share the gospel with others? Or when you look at your life now, you just simply go, man, Jamie, my life has gotten busy. My life has begun to crowd other things out. Or maybe I just have too many passions. Now my passions are all colliding and it's crowded the Lord out. And it's competing for my master passion, which should be Christ. Then surrender. He is our living hope. He's the hope of glory. Heaven awaits. So lay these things before the Lord and if there are things in your life that just need to be surrendered, surrender them to the Lord. And remember, He loves you. Or maybe you just need the flame ignited in your heart once again. A flame just to burn afresh to share the gospel. Or maybe you simply just need a fresh burden for the lost. Pray to the Lord and say, Lord, give me your heart and give me your eyes to see the lost and the hurting. Amen? And Lord, we do love you. And Lord, we're so thankful for you and all that you sacrificed and did for us to rescue and redeem us. Oh, our salvation came at such a high cost. But Lord, may we not just look to our salvation as being for us, but know that this is something you desire to give to the world around us. And so, Father, may we be found passionate for you. And though that may incur suffering or affliction in our life, oh Lord, may it be just a moment to rejoice that we suffer for you, Lord, and for your kingdom. And Lord, we pray, Lord, just fill us afresh with your spirit to be used for your kingdom and for your glory. We ask it in your name. Amen.